bit of a spill back. Welcome to the Layman's Podcast, everybody. My name is William Kinsey. I'm here with Lachlan Gardner. Uh, thanks for tuning in today uh, for this episode. You can follow us on Instagram at Layman's Podcast and Facebook.com forward slash Layman's Podcast. Uh, dark matter matters. And here to talk to us about this is Ben McAllister. How you doing, man? Hello. I'm very well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I forgot you were going to say that. That that was planned. Oh yeah, that's probably <laughs> oh, good. It sounded so natural and yeah. off the cuff. <laughs> um, so as I was saying to you before, I found you online mm-hmm. on on the interwebs doing a speech at it was at UWA, right? That's right. How very 2018 of you. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you used pom poms to I did as yeah. an analogy for the uh, the ratio of dark matter to ordinary matter in the universe. That's right. Which was awesome. So. Yeah, that was um that was called Fame Lab. It's this international science communication competition. They do it's like the main ones in the UK in Cheltenham, and then they do sort of national competitions in different countries, and then they pick like the national winner, and then they go off to the international final. And that was the that was the Australian national final that was at UWA. Yeah, that thing. Yeah, Damn. yeah, it was cool. Um, it was good fun talking about yeah dark matter as you say. I had these little pom poms because there's yeah. a lot of yeah huge imbalance and it's i don't know i think it's a nice way to represent it because i think i find that yeah. I don't know, maybe you guys know a bit about it but generally people kind of don't really have a clue what dark matter is yeah, yeah. which is understandable because it's not tangible well it, yeah. yeah exactly it's not touchable <laughs> it's not like, yeah not like this table exactly yeah. yeah okay so for people listening that don't know which is probably quite a large yeah, portion, yeah, yeah. For sure. yeah. okay cool yeah oh, oh yeah <laughs> i'm glad <laughs> what is dark matter okay all right so basically when we think about all the stuff that makes up like this table, for example, or people or the earth or the sun, black holes, stars, all the, the big stuff out there in the universe, all of that stuff is made up of what's called regular matter. So it's like uh, a handful of different subatomic particles, fundamental particles. Most of it is these things called quarks and electrons, uh, up quarks, down quarks and electrons. This is too much detail. Most of it is made up of like a handful of different things basically. And that's kind of the standard model of particle physics. Yeah. Um, as it turns out, if you look at basically space, you look at the way stuff moves around. So spinning galaxies, galaxy cluster interactions, gravitational strong lensing, other gravitational effects, so cosmology stuff basically, astronomers, yeah. telescopes looking out in space and, and observing things, we find that we can't really explain any of that if we only consider all that stuff we can see. So like the stars and the planets mm-hmm. and the galaxies and the black holes. If you just consider that stuff that you can see with the telescope, uh, that's made up of the stuff that we understand, those fundamental particles, Yeah, nothing should move the way it does. And like the best way we can explain that so far is that there's a whole heap of extra stuff out there mm-hmm. that has mass, so it affects gravity, Ooh. but it doesn't uh, interact with light or regular matter very much at all, so we can't see it. Yeah. So it's matter, has mass, it doesn't interact with light, so it's dark, dark matter. There you have yeah. it. Yeah. And there needs to be a lot of it, basically. So the observations that led, led you guys to that understanding was... Uh, based on our current understanding of gravity, we'd look at a galaxy mm-hmm. and I guess in so in our solar system, planets that are closer to the sun orbit the sun faster versus pla- planets that are further away. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's we can understand that based on our knowledge of gravity right now. But when you apply that understanding to a galaxy, like mm-hmm. what, what did they find? They found that stars on the outside of the galaxy were moving at the same speed as stars that were yeah, within the galaxy? Close, close to the center. So yeah. this work was the 60s, 1960s and 1970s, uh, sort of predominantly by a researcher named Vera Rubin. And this was measuring what are called galactic rotation curves of different galaxies. So the idea there is basically... Uh, well, I guess you can go Google galactic rotation curve and look at it if you're interested. There should be a, a Wikipedia article or something. If you imagine like uh, an X, Y axis, like a plot, which I'll just draw for you guys. Uh, if, if you have on the <laughs> Y axis here, you've got velocity, essentially how fast the stars are moving. And on the X axis here, you have distance from the center. Mm-hmm. Based on the distribution of mass that we can see, the regular matter, the stuff that makes people and planets and galaxies and stuff, that stuff uh, sort of is bulged almost all near the center and then it's very wispy out into the the fringes of like a spiral galaxy like ours. And so you expect the velocity to kind of go up and then kind of decay because now there's less matter. So there's less sort of gravity, effective gravity in that sort of outer area. And so they don't, you know, they're not able to orbit as fast. And I can come back to explaining that why in a minute. But basically what we really see when you look at pretty much every galaxy that we ever observed with these galactic rotation curve observations, instead of going up and then down like that, they go up like this and then they kind of are flat. So the, yeah. the, the sort of rotational velocity is roughly constant 
as you move further out of the center of the galaxy, which is kind of unexpected. And if there's mm. only the stuff we can see, that shouldn't happen. So, yeah. Yeah. Oops. yeah. Nothing against humans. We've only been looking into the stars for yeah, what, decades. Yeah, well, well, exactly. I mean, on a hundreds of years. Yeah, but on a um, you know, geological time scale or a oh, universal right. time scale, it's really tiny. I mean, and impressive. also, yeah, we only we only probe things by looking at electromagnetic radiation, which is you know light. Yeah. So all of our astronomy is pretty much like telescopes of some kind. Although we are kind of entering an era of gravitational wave astronomy. That's that's kind of a different thing. But anyway, is that relating to LIGO? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So yeah. the idea there being that so there are these. Four fundamental forces of nature. There's gravitation, there's electromagnetism, and then there are these two like strong and weak nuclear forces. Yeah. And basically, each of those forces, it's a little hand wavy, but basically has a sort of radiation associated with it. And you can think of electromagnetic radiation, so light like radio waves or visible light, gamma rays, x-rays, all that stuff is associated with electromagnetism. Mm -hmm. And gravitational waves are the sort of radiation associated with gravity. And humans, I mean, the, like, the electromagnetic force is the main force that we actually feel. It's the main force that's relevant in everyday life. Like, I'm able to see you guys right now because photons, particles of light, are bouncing off you and then into my eyes and I can see how they're yeah. reflected. Uh, or even, like, this table. Like, if I push my hand down on the table, the reason my hand doesn't go through the table is because the molecules in the table and the molecules in my hand are holding tight to each other using this electromagnetic interaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they, like, hold tight and then they actually... The, the way that that force actually exists is they exchange photons. Like they shoot little particles of light back and forth at each other. And that is the, the mediator for the electromagnetic force. And yeah. there's an analog for this in gravity with gravitational waves. And it's sort of, uh, so when we look out in space, we typically think of like we catch photons, but we might be sort of entering an era where now that we can detect gravitational waves, we can use that kind of radiation to see things as well. Reality is cooler than science fiction. Right? Yeah, <laughs> right exactly. It's very, it's very cool. photons. Wow. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, the whole energy production system in the body is like exchanging of uh, electrons. I mean, that's just crazy as well. Yeah, yeah. electric currents, uh, yeah, real yeah. motion of charges. Yeah, Electron transport cool. chain, all that stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. What do you say? So with LIGO, which is uh, laser interferometry, right? Yeah, gravitational wave observer. I will preface all of this by saying I am not a gravity waves expert, okay. but I will do my best to <laughs> answer any questions, yeah. Yeah. Um, how do they actually measure the weight? So, so my understanding is that they send a laser down two arms at, mm -hmm. right, at a right angle to right. each other. And oh, I'm, tr I'm trying to remember. It's, it passes through some kind of like almost like a lens through along. Yeah, the, like a splitter and then they sort of have like mirrors. So it's yeah, like one yeah. laser, it splits, it goes into this mirror and that mirror and then they reflect back. Yeah. And those path lengths are meant to be the same, which means you should get interference and you should be able to, if you put your detector over here, detect something. But if the path length of one of those changes with respect mm. to the other, then that changes the signal that you get. That changes the interference pattern and it changes the signal that appears at your detector. Yeah. And because gravitational waves are actually ripples in space-time itself, they can actually change the length of things. But like these effects are so, so small. It's like, like never something... Is it like something like 10 to the power of negative... 21, 24, yeah. something like that in like strain, which I think is change in length over length. I don't know, that's probably horribly wrong, but it's something yeah. like it's very, very, very tiny numbers. And you basically, yeah, you need like a huge detector and you need very, very precise distance measurement in order to be able to observe it. Someone told me that um, the accuracy of these um, laser interferometers is is the equivalent of if you were to measure out the distance from here to Alpha Centauri, which is, mm -hmm. is that is that a galaxy or a star system? That is, a, I'm pretty sure Alpha Centauri itself is, 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 a, is a star. star. Yeah. Um, so you measure out that distance and the accuracy is to within the width of a hair. Mm. Like that's, that's like mind boggling. Is this that laser you're talking about last episode? Yeah. 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 That's LIGO interferometer. In cool. WA, yeah, right. Yeah, uh, I think it's near Jinjin or something like that. There's yeah. one. And then oh, there's um, well, there's, there's something in Jinjin. So at UWA, there is like a whole group devoted to gravity waves and they a research group in the physics department and they actually work with LIGO. They've done some stuff with them. The detectors that have actually that are actually capable of detecting gravitational waves are not in WA. It's uh, sort of like um, research and development stuff. Yeah. But the detectors are in the States and I think there's one coming online in India. There's a lot like LIGO Livingston and LIGO something else these two mm. american detectors and they're building something else and they because like the bigger the larger number of detectors you have it's easier to sort of confirm or deny and gain extra information about the signal yeah. one of the things that's really interesting right now in that field is how fast these gravitational waves move because they should move at the speed of light uh because 
well, that's what the math says. But it's kind of an interesting question as to whether they actually do mm, move yeah. at the same speed as light. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. On the interaction thing again. Um, so it's true that dark matter doesn't interact with us and it also doesn't interact with each other as well. Yeah, it should so have. So that's why it doesn't collect just like regular matter does. Well, it's it, a solid object. It does clump, but it won't yeah, like electrically bond, like yeah. in the way that like, yeah, exactly. So like you won't have yeah, like chemical bonds of any description forming, which are like yeah. largely electromagnetically based. But it's, yeah, so it doesn't form up in the same way that you might get like a solid structure like a table, no. Yeah. And it's because, yeah, with things we know about dark matter, it experiences gravity and takes part in gravity. So it, it has mass and it you know pulls on other stuff and is pulled by other stuff but it doesn't interact with electromagnetism, which means when dark matter comes up against this table, so like my hand won't push through it because of the electromagnetic force, dark matter will. It'll go straight through the yeah. table. It is in fact going straight through the earth and us right now. We are surrounded in the studio by dark matter. Yeah. yeah. It's, it doesn't even care. No, exactly. It just goes straight <laughs> on through. Thought. So yeah. is that hence the reasoning for classifying at least some dark matter as weakly interacting massive particles. Yep. Yeah. So that is that. a very descriptive name. And that's the yeah. thing. It's like, it's weakly interacting. It's massive, meaning it has mass and it's a particle. Yeah. So yeah, among the different theories to explain these dark matter observations, probably the most popular ones are particles. So mm -hmm. the idea that dark matter is made of some particles as opposed to something more exotic or modifying the laws of gravity. Now there are definitely people who do that. So when you consider the fact that so far, all of our evidence for dark matter is essentially gravitational observations, a lot of people say, well, maybe rather than introducing like a, a whole load of new particles, we just say gravity's wrong and yeah. we modify gravity a little bit and maybe that's a more economical solution. And that very well may be the case, but so yeah. far no one has written down a modified gravity theory that is as compelling as these particle yeah. theories are. That's, so, pro that's probably more hard to comprehend, isn't it? To yeah. think of something that's outside the laws of what we know. Yeah I, yeah, I guess it is. I mean, um, we know there is something wrong with gravity. So that is the thing. Like, we know gravity is not quite right because it's not a quantum theory. Yeah. Yeah. So gravity is fully classical. General relativity, even Einstein's famous theory, is, is classical mechanics. So like, yeah. and, and we find like attempts to quantize it are really difficult. So to sort of unify it with quantum mechanics. So we know there is something wrong with it. The question is whether yeah. it's something wrong. See, the thing is like, it's, it's kind of a little hand wavy again, but the, the point is, like the, the problems with gravity are very, very small scale. It's like when you try and go down to like the quantum scale, our gravity theory doesn't work. Yeah. Not very, very large scale, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about like galaxy cluster collisions and stuff yeah. that, that aren't being observed according to GR. Yeah. Life is funny because to play a game, to participate in a game, you have to know the rules, but to exist in the universe, you don't have to know the rules. Like yeah. gauge theory, like the, the, the rules of the universe just happen. And yep, that's when pretty you much observe it. it, they don't necessarily stay the same. Yeah, I like so, to think of it as like we're yeah. discovering these things, you know. Yeah. Like we, th these laws exist. There is a rule for the way that mass interacts with mass. Yeah. yeah. And like we just found it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we're able to do some some stuff with it. We're yeah. very renegade creatures. Yeah. We're very curious. Humans are it's awesome. very uh, powerful when you consider yes. the fact that no oh, yeah. no human being has ever been further from Earth than the moon and some of the stuff that we know about yeah, the rest of the yeah. universe is, is the universe pretty impressive. Observing itself, yeah. mm. So uh, my, I read that some, one of the adjustments that we made to our understanding of gravity was, so currently I think it was in a galaxy, the force of gravity that affects a body is relative to the distance squared is it mm -hmm, from the mm -hmm. from whatever one on r squared yeah yeah so one of the adjustments that they made to try and reconcile this uh, this idea of dark matter and mm -hmm. uh, and does it exist or is it do we need to look at our understanding of gravity was that we changed that relationship to be like proportional yeah it's that, like i think it's correct? one on r so there's these are these are typically what are called um modified Newtonian dynamics theories yeah. or MON. So it's like sort of taking these classical like Newtonian gravity theories, so like Isaac Newton, so very, very mm -hmm. old school stuff and saying that we need to change it at large length scales. So like, you know, we, yeah. we obviously can't say that it's wrong on like a solar system scale because our observations of the way the solar system moves are so, so compellingly close to yeah. the predictions of general relativity. And so like you can't really say that there's anything wrong with it on those kinds of scales. But then when you consider how far apart the galactic like picture is it's sort of like you can maybe say okay maybe above a certain distance the law starts working a different way because we do know that yeah. things like that do occur in other areas of physics but yeah oh man mm. <laughs>
Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting stuff. But uh, yeah, again, I'm not so much a modified gravity guy. I'm more of a dark yeah. matter guy. Yeah, no. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, um, yeah weakly interacting massive particles, as you were saying, is kind of one of the most compelling theories. Um, it, it is sort of an almost weirdly political thing. Well, like weakly uh, yeah. interacting massive particles literally just means things that have mass and are weakly interacting. Mm-hmm. But what it really typically means in practice is a specific group of particles that have those same properties. Uh, typically, there's this one particle that's, I don't know, probably like the most popular one to search for, which is called a neutralino. It's like some supersymmetry thing. It's not not my area, but it's... um. Mm-hmm predicted by these like supersymmetry theorists and they say that this particle that should exist as a result of supersymmetry which if you don't know what supersymmetry is um don't worry about it it's basically just like this really um really big physics theory so like uh if you've ever seen that stephen hawking film theory of everything that uh that yeah, came out yeah. I know, last year or the year before this idea of like searching for a, a grand unified theory or a theory of everything that's going to combine all our understanding of the different fundamental forces of nature and blah 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 yeah supersymmetry was kind of one of the candidates moving in that direction and is supersymmetry opposed to the understandings that we have in the standard model of physics it's more like an extension oh, okay. kind so of. that so was why they were trying to identify the higgs boson and and, and well, do the, all that kind of stuff the higgs boson is actually standard model the yeah. Higgs boson yeah, like okay. completes the standard model of physics yeah. which is nice and then it's sort of like we need to extend it basically to explain a, a series of different things yeah. and supersymmetry was this candidate theory to do that is this candidate theory i should say i'm talking about it as though it is dead and buried uh it, it's not quite dead and buried but there have been sort of a series of um failures in regards to experimental observations of supersymmetry so sure. that was something that was expected the large hadron collider would detect these sort of different supersymmetric particles but that hasn't happened and so supersymmetry is like kind of, I don't know, on shaky ground in a sense. That's probably yeah. a very politically incorrect thing to say in science, but right. yeah. To be honest, I don't really know what resulted from the Large Hadron Collider because I remember that reading, seeing it on the mm-hmm. news all the time, but then eventually I guess they did the experiment and then after that I didn't even yeah. think about it ever again. <laughs> well, the big one was the Higgs boson was yeah. the detection of this like missing particle from the standard model that was predicted yeah. and was really nice and very precisely close to what they wanted it to be. Uh, and then since then, they've been doing basically just enormous particle collisions. So like yeah. if you want to detect very small scale physics, you basically just need to shoot shit at each other really, really quickly uh, and really, really hard, like <laughs> yeah. particles, and then they collide, and then you have high energy, and you can get all kinds of exotic matter that you don't have around. I love and, that. Yeah, <laughs> like at the at the very deep end of our like scientific understanding, it's like we just shoot shit at each other. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, honestly, it's <laughs> been like happens. all, all yeah. of our like particle physics knowledge basically comes from what are called scattering experiments, which is just like collide stuff, and it's just been yeah. about how hard you can collide things <laughs> to get into different energy scales, so you can see more and more stuff. So yeah. it's like yeah. we broke apart atoms, we found like the nucleus and the electrons, great. Then we broke apart the like nucleus, and it's like okay, there's protons, there's neutrons, that's cool. Then you have to get even like bigger bigger collisions to like look inside the nucleus and see that there's quarks and stuff or yeah. like inside the protons and neutrons see there's quarks and stuff making those up and then it was like okay if we want to go deeper we need like enormous colliders which is kind of where like string theory comes in so okay yeah. string theory is the idea that like everything's made of these little strings of energy like and vibrating strings yeah that- yeah it's a very very high concept theoretical stuff but basically in order to like <laughs> the idea would be like inside quarks like there's you know it's all made up of this same stuff and mm. you need like enormous amounts of energy, like colliding things to to reach any of the testable predictions of string theory. So that's not an LHC thing. Right. I get, I get what that means then. Don't mm. try to sort of trace back in time. Just see how things happened. Uh, there was there's some elements of that, like looking at like exotic matter that we don't yeah. certainly have on hand. Yeah. So like there's stuff that's just not present in the current universe that you can make that should have been around in the early universe. Yeah. Things mm. like that. I was, I was reading an article uh, in the midst of the research for this episode, mm-hmm. the small amount of research because mm-hmm. it reminded mm-hmm. me of homework and I didn't like that. Yeah, that's cool. Um, <laughs> it's not for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they were saying they discovered a galaxy that contained very little dark matter. Yes, yes. What's the implications of that? Well, it depends who you ask. So right. this, is, um, this is interesting because – one of the things about like a modified gravity theory is like if you are going to say on certain length scales that gravity should behave in this way, you should observe that everywhere. Mm. Whereas the dark matter thing gives you a little more freedom to say, well, gravity behaves the same way everywhere, but we have some dark matter here. We don't have dark matter there. So that was kind of interesting for dark matter people, I guess, to be able to be like, look, 
you know, not every galaxy has to behave in the same way as it would if you had this very simplistic, at least, yeah. modified gravity theory. So that was yeah. cool. It was a nice little bit of um, dark matter evidence, I suppose. Right. Mm. Although there will be people, I have no doubt, will tell you that it is the opposite of dark matter evidence because this is a kind of, um, I don't know, increasingly discussed field. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I read the comments. I like mm. went to, I was like, whenever mm. I see an article or something, <laughs> I'm like, what do people say in the Reddit comments? Yeah, wait into the comments. Yeah, no question. <laughs> and it was like that. It was like some people were like, well, this means this. And yeah. I'm like, okay, but yeah. someone would be under there. Yeah, yeah, Equally exactly. as upvoted saying, well, no, it actually means mm. this. And I was like, it's oh, true. Fuck it's true. Guys. Um, yeah, mm. uh, it was interesting. The photo fo- that had a sort of artist rendering, not an artist rendering, but uh, visualization. Image, yeah, vi- a visualization. Yeah. Um, and they could they explain that you could see galaxies that are further away and behind this galaxy mm-hmm. because this galaxy was so dispersed. Like, the oh, like a, yeah, like so low dispersed. surface brightness galaxy. Yeah, yeah I thought that yeah. was really interesting that you could see galaxies behind it there are lots of weird cosmology things yeah Yeah, exactly oh doesn't the light also bend around so that's called gravitational strong lens yeah yeah that's one of the key predictions of general relativity it's also another one of the dark matter pieces of evidence because so like that happens in in space time so like you can observe it where you've got some really massive body and you've got something on the far side of it and your telescope is like here on earth Mm. and you can like look in this direction and in this direction and see the same thing because the light from this thing is bending around and coming in on this trajectory and it's also coming in on this trajectory. So you can point your telescope in two different angles in the sky and see the same thing. And from like those angles, you can figure out the degree of strong lensing of this image uh, of whatever's behind this really massive object. And we've observed a couple of instances whereby the amount of lensing can't be explained, again, only by like what we can see. Yeah. So this massive yeah. object, a galaxy cluster or something, you can estimate its size based on what you can see in it, or its mass, I should say. Uh, and then in order to get the degree of lensing that you get of this thing on the other side, you need like way more stuff. So that yeah. also points towards like heavy stuff being present. Have they tried pointing to... Telescopes, telescopes at the same time yeah. you know i don't know i'm not an astronomer but i'm sure i'm sure it's been done i'm sure it's really just one telescope and you see the same image here and here yeah. i'm sure it's more <laughs> more likely more what it is image by pointing to yeah yeah increase the baseline why not uh, yeah. Yeah. Not a scientist. <laughs> yeah uh so yeah that's kind of evidence for dark matter there's some interesting stuff around it not being true be, true being true or not being true but then yeah wimps we we're talking about if we got sidetracked uh <laughs> Did we? Oh, i have no yeah. idea if we got sidetracked this is a wild roller coaster <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so wimps, which largely come from supersymmetry uh, as sort of a motivation, but there's a handful of other kinds of motivations for wimps as well. Anyway, these big particle detectors that you hear about, so things like these like huge tanks of like liquid xenon underground in big gold mines, or well, the one that they're building in Melbourne, they're actually building a uh, detector, or I should say Melbourne, Victoria, in uh, rural Victoria, in Stoll. They're building this big underground thing to try and detect these... Um, wimp particles because if the wimp theory is correct then there should be like a lot of these neutralinos or something else penetrating the earth and if you have these really really sensitive detectors you should get a very very small number of collisions between these particles moving through and the stuff that makes up the detector depositing some energy in your detector which you can then observe in different ways and that kind of changes depending on what the detector is the one in victoria is going to be based on sodium iodide crystals Okay. Uh, so they're going to be yeah, basically looking for like small amounts of energy deposited in those crystals when like a wimp hits a sodium nucleus and causes it to you know recoil away and then it absorbs some of that energy and spits out different things. Mm-hmm. Mm. So those are like wimp experiments and there's been quite a few of them um, sort of in different places around the world over the last couple decades, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, and so far, null results. Okay. And so what you end up with is exclusion plots as they're typically known so again if i draw a plot for you just google it wimp exclusion plots if you're interested um you've got like the strength of the interaction between wimps and regular matter on the y-axis and the mass of the wimp on the x-axis so this is another thing is that we don't know the mass of the particle we're looking for there's kind of like a range of different masses it can be in yeah which is one of the most difficult things about it because it's like it's sort of easy ish to build a detector if you know the mass of the particle you want. Yeah. If you don't know the mass, it gets really, really hard because you don't know how much energy you're talking about. Anyway, so we have these like two parameters and we can basically be like, WIMPs can be anywhere in here mm. in this sort of like search parameter space. And so these detectors will be able to say like, okay, we didn't see anything and we're sensitive to WIMPs in these masses and we got this sensitive. So we know everything above here within this band is excluded. 
You can say there's no wimps here, or yeah. you can say there's no wimps over here, or there's no wimps over here, or whatever. And experiments have been doing that with uh, varying degrees of sensitivity for a while now. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of like wimp stuff, which is not actually what I do. So hopefully before we yeah. get somewhere, we'll actually talk about what I do. But anyway. Well, so, <laughs> so what you do or is yeah. the organ experiment, which that's I right. believe is the oscillating resonant group axion experiment. That's experiment. right. Yeah, yes. that's the one. Uh, yes. So having talked about wimps and dark matter, a bit of an introduction, yeah. uh, what we're trying to detect is actually a different dark matter candidate. It's this thing called an axion, mm -hmm. which if you wanted to be very literal, is a wimp in the fact that it is weakly interacting and it has mass. So it's massive. Yeah. It's a weakly interacting massive particle. But I kind of alluded to the fact that for, I don't know, various political reasons or whatever, taxonomy, if you want, uh, people typically think of wimps as these specific like heavy particles in the sort of 10 or 100 of giga electron volt mass range. Oh, axions, okay. yeah, don't worry about it. Axions actually <laughs> belong to like a, a different class of particles, which are typically called wisps weakly interacting sub-electron volt particles. So they have mass, they're weakly interacting. It's the same like sort of animal if you want, but it's just much, much, much lighter. So we're talking about very, very light particles as opposed to very, very heavy particles. So we call them wisps instead of wimps. And that's because I was reading your one of your research papers and it, mm -hmm. was, it was describing the axion as, uh, so you were looking at it, uh, I can't remember the numbers, but it was like in the 15... 0.5 gigahertz range and then yeah. the axions you were looking for them at like a massive like it was like 100 uev is that yeah is that's that, right 100 uh, sub electron Mi volts so that's micro electron volts Mi so the, yeah the the u is like a mu the greek letter mu which is I, the, the yeah. Yeah, prefix for 10 to the minus six so yeah <laughs> i hundred... googled that term and i was <laughs> nothing came out i was like fuck i'm out of my depth so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so like 100 micro electron volts is 10 to the minus four electron volts which is like 13 or 14 orders of magnitude away from these wimp yeah. searches, which are at like giga electron volts. So yeah. like they're like really, really tiny particles compared to like the wimp dark matter stuff. Yeah. Um, the cool thing about axions is that they come to us as sort of a motivated particle from an entirely separate area of physics, which is what makes them nice dark matter particles. So like wimps are motivated by supersymmetry. Axions are motivated by this thing called the strong CP problem, uh, yeah, yeah. which I'm not going to go into in too much detail because it's very <laughs> arcane and not that interesting. But basically, there is like a really, really good theory in particle physics called quantum chromodynamics, which explains like the way the stuff inside atoms interacts with each other. So it's like quarks and gluons and stuff like that. So it explains yeah. the way like atomic nuclei work. Go on. I was just saying, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes, I understand. Cool. Um, and this theory has this huge problem in it called the, the strong CP problem, which basically boils down to experimentally, um, we would expect that the neutron can have an electric dipole moment, which you can think about as, I don't know, kind of like a charge if you want. Um, but we know it doesn't. Or observational evidence constrains it to be very, very, very small, uh, which starts like a fine tuning problem. So the yeah. fine tuning problem is a pretty common thing in physics where it's like, okay, there's no reason for this number to be zero. It's observed to be zero. Like it's free. It can be anywhere at once. So why is it zero? Like it's possible that it's just random chance, but it's very unlikely when you consider the range of possible numbers it could be. Like, why is it zero? And so that's essentially like the strong CP problem in a nutshell. And one of the best solutions to it is this basically... Again, uh, boring details. It boils down to introducing this particle called the axion. And when you introduce the axion, you see that it should have mass and it should have a very, very weak interaction with matter, which makes you go, oh, cool. The axion, it solves the strong CP problem. It also looks like dark matter, mm. which like is pretty compelling. It's like it's a nice reason to look for something because it's sort of motivated. It's a nice solution to another problem. It also can solve this other problem. So let's try and detect it. And yeah. That's pretty much what we're trying to do. And how does the actual experiment work okay so axions are theorized to have different couplings to the standard model so there's the axion photon coupling which is probably the most common one so photons again particles of light they like you know the light that's bouncing off us all right now radio waves microwaves whatever um different kinds of photons and that's that's the experiment that we're oh that's the coupling we're actually exploring there are other couplings as well, like axion electron coupling and stuff like that, that other people are doing experiments on. But our idea is basically we, we believe axions exist. We believe dark matter exists. If axions constitute dark matter, we're surrounded by axions right now, yep. which means if I can detect, to turn those axions into photons, 
I can detect those photons because I certainly can't detect axions yeah. <laughs> because they're very, yeah. very weakly you know, directly. I don't have any, I don't have an axion counter. But yeah. as humans, we've gotten really, really, really good at detecting photons. In fact, it yeah. is about the only thing we're really, really good at detecting. <laughs> when we do like most like experiments, we're really detecting photons at the end of the day is what it boils down to. So like, yeah. we're really good at that. So we take something we can't detect and we turn it into something we can. And then it's about, it becomes a problem of counting photons, which is like sort of a classic problem in physics, which is nice to do. The way you turn axions into photons is basically by interacting them with a big, strong magnetic field. So this is what the maths tells us that uh, introduces the axion, that the axion is coupled to photons through this weak interaction called the inverse Primakov effect, whereby an axion comes in, it interacts with a magnetic field and it generates a photon. Mm -hmm. And that photon has a frequency corresponding to the mass of the axion. And so again, we don't know the mass of the axion, similar to not knowing the mass of the WISP, which means now we're trying to detect photons of unknown frequency, which is very, very difficult. You need yeah. Yeah, like specialized detectors in it. They don't really exist. So this is a lot of what the research goes into is building these detectors for photons of unknown frequency. Yeah. So... You guys have been using a, what is it, a haloscope? Yeah, so haloscope is actually the, the name for this broad class of experiments because yeah. it's uh, it's trying to detect particles in the galactic halo and scope, like, you know, telescope, microscope, it's a piece of instrumentation to look at something. So, mm -hmm. like, we're scoping the galactic halo for axions. That's essentially it. Yeah. And how does that work? So it's like a microwave cavity. That's, yeah. that's about the extent of my knowledge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's dead right. I mean, that's so again, like we've got axions, we turn on a big, strong magnet in order to make the magnet work. And for other reasons, the whole thing has to be very, very cold because mm -hmm. the way you generate these strong magnetic fields is typically with what's called a superconducting solenoid. So basically like if you've ever seen an electromagnet, like at a junkyard or something like picking up cars or whatever, it's going to be like a big coil of wire mm -hmm. um, sort of all sort of wrapped in one direction. And then you run a big, strong current through that and it generates a strong magnetic field. And it's like just an electromagnet. You can make one at home if you've got like a coil of wire and a battery and something yeah. metallic, you can pick stuff up. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's basically just that, but like on steroids because you make it out of <laughs> superconducting wire uh, so it has like no resistance and you can just put like enormous currents in there and you get these huge magnetic fields generated which are you know very very cool mm. um, and those are really expensive and uh, hard <laughs> to engineer and very high field so you get one of those you make it cold so the wire goes superconducting so you can have your big strong magnet and then any axions inside the magnet are being turned into photons just automatically but some small number some small amount of them due to this like coupling constant and then it becomes a problem of how do you catch those and what we do is we build microwave resonators now the again so like the frequency of these photons depends on the mass of axions that you're looking for so like most experiments look for axions that correspond to kind of gigahertz photons which are in the microwave range so like the same kind of um radiation that like your microwave oven uses to heat up food it's like that kind of frequency of electromagnetic radiation yeah. uh and so like a microwave resonant cavity, which is what we use, is a device, it, the concept of resonance, anyone who's ever played music will be familiar with. So it's like there are certain frequencies at which things will resonate, which is to say they have these sort of natural modes, uh, which essentially like, you know, a pane of glass or something, if you hit it with the right frequency of sound waves, it'll start to vibrate a lot harder. Yeah, I was thinking like wine glasses. Yeah, yeah, would, pretty much. Yeah. That's, so that's, that's resonance of like sound waves in some material. Yeah. It's a similar kind of thing. So like if you get like a big, um, like cylinder of metal and you hollow it out and you have some empty cylinder there are frequencies of radiation that will resonate within it so like the sound waves resonating with the glass they'll be trapped and they'll sort of bounce around yeah. and depending on the size of that detector or the size of that cavity you get different frequencies and like again so it's not like sound waves like you can hear it this is like electromagnetic waves that are sort of trapped inside the can and they radiate around mm. uh and so basically if you've got a bunch of photons and you've got a can that's at the right frequency you can detect them and that's Pretty much what the halo scopes are. Whoa. Mm. <laughs> I'm just barely holding on. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so it's like... Uh, no, I do get... No, I, I get it, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Cool. So you're just trying to catch... Like, you're trying to make them resonate. The reason you want them to resonate, uh, which basically means, like, the photons, they can... So, like, you've got your can. It has some size. You're like... It's usually a copper can. Uh, it's hollow in the middle. And it's in this big, strong magnet. Axion comes in, turns into a photon. If that photon corresponds to one of the natural resonant frequencies of the can it'll bounce around yeah. and you want it to bounce around because the longer it's there it improves your chance of detecting it mm -hmm. and then you basically stick like a probe into the can and you just try and count photons and mm -hmm. that's that's it and then it, it, it all becomes about increasing the precision of your photon counters which is not like a new problem and it's not a dark matter problem it's just like microwave yeah. engineering basically like yeah. making you know better and better photon detectors and that's that's what we do 
Um, I came across this, the bullet cluster as well mm -hmm. in my reading. And so I think that basically serves as a, an example of why we could probably steer away from thinking that there's something wrong with our understanding of gravity and leaning towards dark matter. So could you explain maybe how the bullet cluster is significant? Yeah, yeah, cool. In pointing towards dark matter research? Yeah, for sure. So the bullet cluster is cool. It's one of the things that dark matter people like to show because it's something about dark matter that you can actually see, yeah. which is kind of cool. So if you've got to do like a presentation, you pretty much always include a picture of the bullet cluster because yeah. it's like, it looks cool and we can see it. Uh, basically the bullet cluster is this like huge collision of galaxies. Um, and it's like, yeah, so galaxies colliding and you can look at the stuff you can see when two galaxies collide and it's chaotic. Like you see, you know, jets of matter spraying off and all this weird stuff happening when, you know, two galaxies are colliding. But based on the way this stuff is moving around, you can sort of like reconstruct the gravitational forces at play. And by doing that, you can get a map of where all the matter is, all the, all the heavy stuff is. And if you look at this interaction, you see like the two galaxies collide, you see like, you know, the, the matter's all doing all this crazy stuff. But if you map where all the mass goes, it just goes like straight through, yeah. which oh, would wow. support the dark matter hypothesis because these dark matter particles don't interact and they would just go straight through each other. Yeah. And that's what we observed. Yeah, so it's pretty pretty cool. Damn. Go look up a picture. It's actually <laughs> totally makes sense. Yeah, because mm. yeah, it would it passed straight through. It wouldn't. Yeah. And so like all the regular yeah. matters all colliding and the dark matter is just going straight through. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, it's cool stuff. So yeah, we don't know the mass of the dark matter though. We know like how much of it there is. We know the density by yeah. like doing these gravitational things. But then depending on how heavy you think the particle is, that means there's like more or less of them within like a cubic centimeter. Yeah. 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 So that's essentially a lot of, yeah, basically depending on how heavy you think it is, that sort of sets how you're trying to detect it. So as you mm -hmm. said, 100 micro electron volts is sort of the range of axion masses that we're interested in with organ. Yeah. Um, other detectors are looking for heavier or lighter axions uh, in different ways. But basically, yeah, we're building these resonant cavities around the sort of 100 mUeV corresponds to 26 gigahertz, something around there, yeah. uh, which is actually technically not microwave. It's actually technically this like X-band millimeter wave frequency. But anyway, it's, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> microwaves for, for all intents and purposes. Yeah. I remember hearing the term in your talk dilution refrigerator yes what, yes what, where does that come into the experiment okay cool so remember how i said everything needs to be really cold yeah that's, that's where it comes where it in comes yeah so uh the basic components of the thing are a dilution refrigerator which, which is like is a hilarious name by the way yeah it's, it's like good. something a cosmic trickster would have in their kitchen <laughs> <laughs> dilution refrigerator. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I need to work on my enunciation clearly because it's actually a dilution refrigerator. Delight oh. dilution. Yeah, okay. but lots of people Damn after it. the talk were like, what's a dilution refrigerator? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, no, no, no. Unique New York, unique New York. <laughs> <laughs> need to get my enunciation on point. But yes, dilution. Um, so it's it's basically, yeah, like a, a cryostat. So like, in again, in different areas of physics, uh, we've been working for decades to make stuff colder because interesting things happen when stuff gets cold. And so like basically at this point, it's not actually that hard to get to four Kelvin, which is like the temperature essentially close to like the flash point of helium. So where helium goes from liquid to gaseous. Um, so you can do that by using like a helium, what's called cryostat, like a cryo cooler, just a really powerful fridge. Um, and then if you want to go lower, you need like lower than 4K. You have to rely on these quantum mechanical processes it's this weird like helium three helium four dilution process uh yeah it's 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 weird but if you google it if you're interested you'll see something about how it works but basically it's like how to get extra cooling power to make fridges even colder and and considering these experiments uh, are basically trying to detect a very very small number of photons we need a very very low amount of background noise and so like everything with any temperature is constantly emitting photons. Like we're all emitting photons right now, black body radiation. And so even in your cryostat, all of the components are emitting noise, essentially thermal noise, which when you're trying to detect a very, very small number of photons that washes out your signal entirely. Yeah. So you want to make everything as cold as you possibly can to reduce the amount of noise photons. So you have a better chance of detecting your signal from axion photon conversion. And that's what the fridge does. Is this, does this tie into signal processing or signal analysis rather? You definitely have to do good signal analysis, yeah. totally. Because what you're reading out is ultimately like voltage. Uh, so you've got some like electromagnetic probe inside your resonator and it's sampling like voltage noise essentially. Yeah. And then you have to process that and turn it into like information about how many photons are kicking around, Yeah, which is yeah, a bit of a pain. So how cold would you say it was? 
Cool. So they can actually go to seven millikelvin, which is a few like seven thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. Yeah. It's, that's absurdly cold. I mean, that's like kind of record temperatures for these dilution fridges. Yeah. Uh, yeah, which is interesting. How cold is space? Oh, much hotter. Uh, like two, three Kelvin, something like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Much colder than Oh, space. tropical. Yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah, right. basically Bahamian, Bahamian. yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so, originally people thought that as the universe expands, the gravity within the universe would be pulling back against that expansion and would result in a in a big crunch or a, mm-hmm. the universe would collapse in on itself but that's people don't think that that's going to happen anymore and do you know could you explain why that is and what we understand about okay things all right you're testing my undergrad cosmology here <laughs> um so my understanding is that basically the rate of expansion of the universe is kind of something that people have been trying to measure for a while Mm -hmm. and it kind of depends on this other stuff called dark energy so you mentioned the pom-pom thing um when we think about like the composition the the energy composition of the universe including all mass energy so if you remember einstein's famous equals mc squared equation it's like energy mass has uh, an association with energy so if you just measure up all the energy in the universe about five percent of it is the regular matter uh like atoms, stuff makes people, planets, galaxies, all that stuff. Uh, about 25% of it-ish is the dark matter. So about five times as much as all the regular matter. So all this stuff we've been talking about. And the remaining like 70% is dark energy, which is like yeah. energy that is completely unexplained. We don't think it's in dark matter, mass energy. It's just extra energy that people believe, cosmologists, is connected to the expansion rate of the universe, basically. So, like, the amount and the balance of, like, matter pulling in versus dark energy pushing out is what sets your universal expansion rate. Yeah. Um, there was some, you're correct, like, big results discovered about uh, what, like, the whether we're in, like, a universe that's expanding and accelerating or a universe that's expanding but slowing down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I believe the idea is that we're expanding but slowing down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, is the current current understanding. Yeah. And that's related to the, you know, proportions of dark energy and stuff like that. Yeah. And dark energy is even less understood than dark matter. Than Absolutely. Dark matter. Oh, yes, yeah. exactly. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, we're kind of like it's sort of, it, it sort of also, also almost becomes a sort of like crushingly futile task <laughs> when you try yeah. to detect this stuff. You're like, okay, we detect dark matter, we'll know about way more of the universe, but like yeah. still just a minuscule fraction. Or I don't know, a third is pretty good, right? Like if we know how a third of it works, that'd be better than a twentieth. Yeah. Ter- mm. Terrence McKenna once said, Where is it writ that anthropoid apes should understand reality itself? Yeah, sure. There's no reason. <laughs> we're trying. Yeah, there's no reason for us to, but we have to try. That's yeah. the that's the main thing. Oh, for sure. It's I get so excited when I hear about new discoveries and mm. people really working hard to understand things like mm. Ah, oh, it's just it's refreshing, you know. Yeah, dark matter is kind of a sexy topic in physics. Like I find that, like you know, I go to conferences. When I go to conferences that are like largely dark matter conferences, obviously everyone there's on the same page. But when you yeah. go to like more general physics conferences, I find people are kind of interested in it because it's like I don't know, it's kind of one of these like big questions type things, and yeah. people people get excited about it. It's a fun area to work in, definitely. Oh yeah, oh, you could r- totally romanticize the whole mm. field, like. Mm. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm just waiting for the like sci-fi original movie or something that I can maybe get a bit part in. Or yeah. uh, <laughs> I know there's a TV series called Dark Matter, but I haven't ever seen it. Uh, it's like some sci-fi thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Are you are you are you um, bracing for some groups of people who are going to go down a more metaphysical route and start saying that dark matter or dark energy is God? <laughs> Yeah, look, I, you actually do get it. Like, you get yeah. a lot of interesting oh, stuff, as you shit. might imagine. Um, I had people after Fame Lab messaging me talking about how, like, they think that, like, dark matter is this, you know, like, cosmic force that, like, generates human consciousness and it's, like, the interaction of some dark matter waves with our brain waves. And it's all kind of like, look, ultimately, like, you can't, like, ever be, like, Th- this is complete like bullshit mm. because it's just like well yeah i mean it might be true but it's like the cosmic teacup argument to a degree <laughs> it's yeah. like yeah well you fucking say anything it's like okay, is yeah. like might be true i don't know yeah. like, you know it's like it's, it's not helpful i don't think to think about it that way when we don't understand it so in, tr- in terms of like trying to come up with all this, these like weird theories about how it is some god being it's sort of like yeah. well okay let's worry about it when we know more about it <laughs> like yeah. i think it's unlikely but you know it's it's interesting what happens with humans when you are devoid of scientific context. Yep. Like oh, yeah. I, I 
try to picture myself like what what would I think if I was alive 500 years ago? Yep. I would probably look up at the sky and think, look at the sun and think, that's God. Mm. That's oh, exactly. God. Like, it's without any <laughs> collective connection to the collective consciousness. It's like without totally. people. That's what people did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> having, <laughs> yeah, breaking down part. Sun cults yeah. were a thing for a while. Uh, people, yeah, I mean, it's this idea called God of the Gaps. It's like we, we, we yeah. at some point we don't understand and we're like, well, that's God. And mm-hmm. I think that that's essentially the dark matter thing. It's sort of like, well, yeah, okay, there might be a God, there might be something, but like ultimately you're just talking out of your ass. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Like, we need to actually try and answer these questions. And I think ultimately the God of the Gap stuff can be damaging because it means that you stop looking. You know, yeah. if you're like, oh, this, this thing is God, we shouldn't bother trying to understand it. It's like you don't, you don't learn anything that way, you know? At yeah. the very least, try and figure out what yeah. God is. Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> we need to accept our ignorance, mm. and instead of just jumping on the the first available explanation or idea. Yeah, I mean, it's just crazy to think that. I find um, a lot of people that are skeptical about research that's coming out. It's like I feel like there's always some kind of element of like they're afraid of losing power. Mm. Like it's. I remember was it Copernicus? No, it was like Galileo initially made the claim that. The, that we aren't the center of the universe and yep. we actually orbit the sun and Prometheus still in fire. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was burnt. He was burnt alive. Was it yeah, Galileo was burnt alive for his views? I don't on, believe. I don't know, I or was it Copernicus? One of them was. Yeah. One of them was like fucking. Everyone was burnt alive back then. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. It's like something you could Google, but you're definitely right. It was one of those guys yeah. burnt for living. Yeah. I mean, it's like um, what? even like Newton <laughs> when deriving gravitation was like realized ultimately that over time the solar system would kind of fall apart with just like Newtonian gravity. And so mm. rather than going further and being like, okay, uh, there's a big problem with my theory that's otherwise very good. How do I solve it? He was like, oh, God must step in occasionally and set everything to rights. You know, oh, just like geez. when the universe is about to, when the galaxy is about to spiral out, God comes in and just corrects it so that it does <laughs> obey these laws I've written down. And then it was like, you know, like centuries before we had the corrections to, to Newton's equations to account for these things in general relativity. So mm. yeah, it's like mm. if you, if you, yeah, I think like going down the mystical path, it's like, look, I don't know. It can be fun to think about, but I don't think it's really <laughs> helpful. And I don't think there's any evidence for it. Like you can't, yeah. you, you know, yeah. you can say whatever you want. You can make up theories all day, but I don't think it's a helpful way to go about things. Do you ever in your spare time uh, lend any brain power to thinking about what was before the big bang? Or you, is that, I, is that so far out that you're like, I'm going to just spend my time on dark matter? <laughs> I, I love to think about like lots of other more fundamental stuff. Yeah. In terms of like prior to Big Bang, like I definitely have thought about it, but I don't have any answers for you. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. did, I'd be writing them down. But uh, I don't know, stuff I, 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 I often say, like if I wasn't going to be a physicist, I'd want to be a neuroscientist because I think mm-hmm. things like, you know, origin of consciousness is like oh, yeah. a huge question. Very interesting not well understood uh mm. like stuff like that is very cool origin of life itself like lots of lots of these big questions i definitely do like to think about i think most scientists do at some point or another like to sit down and think about these things and, and most people in general if they're if they're that way inclined yeah, yeah. that's something we've talked about on pod before like mm. it's a wild, fascination. wildly theorizing mm. out of our depth about <laughs> consciousness and where it comes from yeah like, sure oh, is it like a mycelium and where the spores yeah well <laughs> It's fun to think about. I, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like I often think like, okay, so our emotions are all chemistry. Like our, you know, movement of our body is all electricity, you know, electrical impulses. Like where mm. does the where does the consciousness come in? And like if mm. you take a dead body and you like put the chemicals in it that make our brains feel this way and you pump the blood around and it's like, you know, at what point does it start being alive and start being a person? Like, yeah, yeah I don't know. It's, it's interesting just a vessel. Stuff. It's just the antenna, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's weird. Even, even the best neuroscientists don't really know the answer to that. No, well, yeah, it's not, it's not yeah. understood. <laughs> exactly. And then, so this is where like things like people come in, they're like, oh, so we don't know what consciousness is. We don't know what dark matter is. Put those two together. Yeah. You've got yourself an answer. It's oh, like, yeah. well, oh, yeah, yeah. maybe even. <laughs> the yeah, the yeah. universal consciousness. <laughs> two things I don't understand. Put them together. Yeah. And yeah. It's something I understand. It's something I can understand. <laughs> exactly. Solve one uh, problem with another. Yeah. Two wrong to make a right. Yeah. <laughs> two birds with one stone. No, that one doesn't apply. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah, it does. Anyway. Do you think that you could pinpoint a moment that really got you excited about? Because obviously you're very excited about questioning some of these big fundamental yeah, unknowns yeah. like um do you remember any at any point you know maybe in high school or even in your childhood that you were like this is where i sort of this is where it all started for me and this is 
you know, somewhere where you intrinsically get that motivation to do what you currently do and to explore those questions. Like, is there any point where you can be like, yeah, that was sort of it for me. That's the start. That was the Kindle or the, yeah, I, the I spark. Can, I can point at a few things. Um, in high school, uh, we were fortunate enough to have like an after school program where some UWA researchers actually from ICRA, which is the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research. It's a collaborative group between uh, UWA and uh, Curtin University. And they, some, some researchers from there, Professor Peter Quinn and some of his students came out to the school and kind of did like, you know, for a couple of weeks in a semester, like after school workshops on like mm. cosmology and space science and stuff like that, which was like really, really awesome and sort of like inspired that interest in me quite a bit. So then when I went to uni, I kind of thought I was going to be an engineer. I kind of always thought I was going to do engineering. So I was doing engineering, but I kind of put my second major as physics because I was just like interested in it. And I was mm. like, you know, always kind of doing it and doing engineering at the same time. And then when I finished undergrad, I sort of like in my third year, I kind of was not really vibing the engineering so much. Like it was like, it was cool, but it was sort of like, it didn't, it didn't like grab me in the same way some of the physics stuff did. And in particular, I remember this one time uh, in like my final semester of physics where I was doing this, um, sort of astrophysics unit and the lecturer showed us this video which is actually from phd comics which is this like web comic the guy uh who makes phd comics i think is jorg or george or jorge uh, uh <laughs> one is, like, J J -O -R -G -E. so it's probably jorge i don't know anyway yeah. uh jorge sham he went and spoke to some guys at cern about dark matter and he made this little video you can actually go check it out um I forget what it's called, but if you Google PhD Comics Dark Matter uh, video, you'll see it. And it like breaks down the Dark Matter problem probably far more elegantly than I have in the last, I don't know how long. And uh, basically I was watching that and I was just like, wow, that is like, there's just so much room to explore. Mm. There's just so much like Pauline Anderson stuff here. And we're sort of like only just getting into the era where we can think about actually finding those answers. Yeah. And I was like, well, I want to do that. And then I saw there was an honors and I was sort of like at the end of third year and I was trying to decide whether I wanted to do my engineering masters or go into physics research. And I saw there was an honors project that was about dark matter detection. And that was like, that's what I'm doing. Mm. So, yeah. Wow. So science communication got you into. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I was always like along the science kind of route, but like definitely like, a, a couple of different yeah science communication aspects are key. I read a couple of books that kind yeah. of made me like nudged me towards the physics away from the engineering. I guess you'd say yeah. So it's all not just about just being able to understand the topic. It's about like getting you inspired. Yeah, you get inspired. Right. Absolutely, yeah. no yeah. question. That's that's like the you know the carriage metaphor oh, we've been talking yeah. about like on like throughout <laughs> the whole podcast. Go on. It's like you have the the, the first carriage, which is the science mm -hmm. elite. <laughs> <laughs> you want to give it that kind of note. Yeah. You have like say the fourth carriage is just people aren't really interested in that mm -hmm. working blue collar people. Mm. And if you have no sort of communication between the first and the fourth one, then yeah. there's all sorts of ideas that yeah you're inventing about misunderstandings, miscommunications, like, yeah, uh, and anti intellectualism, anti science, mm -hmm. a lot of fear. But if you actually can communicate from the first one to the fourth one, then yeah, totally, then it's just everything works so much more smoothly. Yeah, I uh, I went and saw Richard Dawkins when he was in Perth uh, a couple of weeks ago now. I don't yeah. know, and uh, he did like a little speech about his book and then he did a Q&A at the end. And I was fortunate enough to ask him a question. And I was like, what do you think we can do to combat the rising tide of anti-intellectualism and sort of anti-scientific thinking? Yeah. And he said that he thinks that the best thing to do is to inspire wonder and not dumb mm. things down. And yeah, he's like, yeah. you shouldn't go in with the idea of being like, oh, this is how a quantum computer works. Here's a little doll and here's another doll. And it's like people don't, you know, it doesn't people don't resonate with that. You yeah. need to you need to like show people the stuff that we don't know and inspire like mm. them into believing that we need to find out. And you know, and that's always what I always try and do with dark matter is give people a sense of how big a scale this problem has to it and how little we know about it. And like yeah. we're just kind of on the cusp. When, you know. That's yeah, that's a good point because that's kind of how humans are built to operate like we get our progress is built on or inspiration mm. ecstasy just like a that. relentless i don't know push of discovery yep that's that's the thing which is why i'm like mm. i'm totally on board with with the mars thing you know it's oh, like yeah. with the, the yeah. mars mission it's just like yeah i mean that's what that's what humans have always done is like just explore you know push out exactly you gotta, yeah. you gotta do it you gotta have that spirit or we're not gonna get anywhere it um so I've got a few people that have inspired me to get because I like love these kind of topics and mm -hmm. someone who really set the set that in motion 
which I don't know if that's it's a cliche thing to say as, as like a non-physics like mm-hmm. you know researcher, but Neil deGrasse Tyson was a big mm. one for me, and as an extension of that, Carl Sagan, and then uh, I've read books by Michio Kaku mm-hmm. and uh, Dr. Brian Cox or uh, Professor Brian Cox rather. Mm. Um, you know, these guys have been great uh, for inspiring me, and it's like it's not like pre- presenting the information and then and sort of force feeding it to me. It's actually getting me like hooked on the wonder and the, and the awe of it all. Mm-hmm. And then that just, that just sets off like a cat- catastrophic reaction where I just like find myself reading and wanting to know more because of that. They've just triggered that in me. But what broke my heart was um, I think Neil deGrasse Tyson once said like, if we can get, <laughs> cause I'm, I'm on board with going to Mars. I think that's a great idea. Like, mm. but he said, uh, if we had the capabilities to go to Mars and terraform it, we can like, fix earth and i was like no don't say that man let's go to mars we'll just fix earth as well like yeah I'm, let's, let's get out there I, I think we should absolutely if i'm going to take this to another level is like, i definitely think we should become a spacefaring you know civilization like it's just totally yeah, there's the, no way we can't there's lots of arguments right that are like sort of compelling where it's like oh you know you've got these resources why don't you spend them on fixing earth and it's like okay mm. should we also quarry the pyramids for stone and scrap the eiffel yeah. tower for iron yeah. like do you have no sense of wonder yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. you need to yeah only listen to noises that that's an xkcd line i think uh he met random one said in one of his comics like i only listen to noises that save starving babies <laughs> <laughs> You know, at a certain point, you have to realize there are other things to do as well. Uh, yeah. Sort of to be fair, though, I think I, if I, if I if I had to move to Mars, I think I would desperately miss Earth. Oh, totally. I think you would find out yeah. that there's something like built in you that you would like miss it more than like your mother dying. I feel like that's how I would feel. Like I try and think about it, I'm like. It's very uncomfortable for me to. Oh yeah, I mean, maybe being able to go outside is, is yeah. something that yeah, you'd miss. Nice. Yeah, like visit Mars, but yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. I'm a, land, I'm a land boy. It'd be very hard to be one of the first people to go there. Like, I, do you think yeah. you could do that though? If, if someone, if Elon Musk gave you a call and said, it's "Like you're going to go to Mars," <laughs> we're taking thirty you're people. The first call. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He rings yeah. me up. <laughs> How'd you get this number? <laughs> hey, <Ben>. Elon Musk. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, if he said to you. Do you want to Hypothetically, go? Yeah, and it was a one-way trip and it was like say goodbye to your friends and family, but you mm-hmm. know, you could continue your research and and get into all sorts of things there, but Yeah. Uh what would be This is this is a question I've thought about before, as I think a lot of people have, like could you do it? Could you go to Mars? And I don't yeah. know. I have ultimately thought that I could or could not. I have, you know, a couple of times been like, yeah, I reckon I could do it. That would be cool. That would be worth it. Like that's a that's a yeah. worthwhile way to spend your life. But other times I'm like, oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll go on the next one. <laughs> yeah, maybe the <laughs> second one. <laughs> people are never coming home. Like maybe you got to hope if you go on the next one. So yeah, I don't know. It's a tough question. Yeah. It really is something you have to ask yourself. I remember oh, yeah. hearing though that to get to Mars, like you have to, the timing is like so important because mm-hmm. like the way the orbit. It's the orbits, yeah. Yeah, like if you, like it's like the shortest time was something like two years, but if you, like the furthest away point is like more than eight years. Yeah, I think it's a bit shorter than two years, but yeah, there's like a huge variation depending yeah. on like where they are in their respective orbits totally yeah. around the sun. We'd have to have a lot of innovation with uh Space, space travel? travel yeah no question <laughs> have that to be oh feasible no question at all <laughs> god yeah. i can't even deal with like an hour in a car mm. a road trip mm. <laughs> yeah can't imagine like like at the least two years i just did that 17 hour perth london direct flight oh, uh, yeah. on my way to this conference in germany and that was not too bad actually i thought i was gonna hate it i was like dead set i didn't want to do it but like the people i was traveling with wanted to try it and i was like okay fine so yeah it was good it was actually yeah. fine i recommend it Qantas. Okay, thank you. yeah. You can, I don't recommend it. Yeah. No, you, <laughs> but people like me, they're like a fidgety and like very mm, physical. Mm. Yeah, I just can't deal with sitting down that long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess like you're going to be sitting that long anyway. It's about whether you get a break in the middle, you know. Yeah. That's the thing. And I like, I, I was like dead set. I was like, I'm going to need the break. I can't stand it. But I think probably it had something to do with the fact that I had an empty seat next to me, which is always good. Oh, yeah. You know, you get a little extra leg room. That's it's true. a good time. Yeah. So, yeah. What? So you were at conferences in Germany for two, last couple of weeks, yeah, two weeks. Maybe? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what what was the 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 content of that? Was it just one big conference, or was there a couple? Or so I was actually firstly at this conference in Hamburg called Patris. It's the fourteenth annual Patris workshop on axions, wimps, and wisps. Yeah, so it's like a big dark matter conference. It's people from all over the world, dark matter community, kind of talking about their experiments and theory and stuff like that, which was cool. That was mm. like a week. That was at DESI, actually, uh, or DESI as they call it. That's the Deutsches Elektronisches Synchrotron. It's like a, a big God. German, um, like essentially like particle accelerator, like a synchrotron. Um, and it's like kind of 
I mean, I guess it's still operational. Yeah, uh, parts of it have and have been have not been used for different things at different times. But anyway, it like hosts a big research sort of community there, and so they they had this um, Axion workshop, which was cool. Mm. And then the next week, we were down in Saarbrücken, which is this little German town, visiting a researcher there, uh, sort of a collaborator of our research group. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah. Wow. What was the, what was the Desi called again? Deutsches Elektronisches Synchrotron. I think it's S Y from Synchrotron, uh, which you know is German electron synchrotron. It's it's it sounded to me like also like a, just an e, a German EDM rave. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah. A, Desi. a special night yeah, at Berghain Berghain Super Party. Night club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, totally. Yeah, German um, electronica. Why not? Just, just so I don't forget it, I remember when you were talking about Neil deGrasse, I was watching a video about him talking about dark matter mm-hmm. and he was trying to make the point that you should call it dark gravity because it was like we don't know that it's matter oh, as we know right. it. So this comes down to like, yeah, sure. Yeah. So yeah, our observations are gravitational. So we know there's extra gravity, yeah. which we would what well, most people think is particles, which would indicate that they're dark matter. But yes, it could be some exotic mechanism producing extra gravity. Mm. Yeah. yeah, totally. Okay. Oh, so that's what you're talking about before that there's different sort of camps. Yeah, sort well, of thinking about it in different ways. Or? Yeah, in a sense. Yeah, you can think about it as particles. You can think about it as some modification to gravity, or you could think about it as some more exotic thing, whereby like there's no particles, there's just extra gravity that comes from some place that's not mass. I guess right. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But for the lay public, probably it's just minutia. Yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, yeah. I mean, what ultimately we'll get answers to these questions. <laughs> like yeah, when yeah. We, we figure out what it is or is not. Yeah. I'm reading a book by Mitch Kark at the moment called It's Like Hyperspace or mm-hmm. something like that. And he puts forward this idea that um, the fundamental for, like laws of physics, uh, when you express them in higher dimensions, they mm-hmm. simplify. And I, I kind of vaguely understand. This is the second time reading this book and I'll probably read it four or five times. Um but yeah, he's basically yeah puts the idea forward that uh, in three dimensional in three dimensions uh, we are only seeing like the echoes of these forces that are, are probably like mm-hmm. operating in higher dimensions. Yeah, and, right, like projections. Yeah, is that um? I guess I mean, that kind of is there any leeway there to explain? I guess that kind of ties to string theory. Like, so string theory often deals with these like higher dimensional, higher physical dimensions mm. um, to explain. <laughs> where these strings exist and yeah. it's like tightly bound, very small spatial dimensions. Uh, <clears throat> it's honestly not really my field, but yeah. I know certainly that people who work on string theory also propose things that kind of are like axions. Mm. So like there are some like axion motivations within string theory that sort of tie into the dark matter thing. Yeah. Yeah. Some like connected, connected assumptions. Yeah. He uses a lot of um, quite uh, beautiful metaphors to kind of explain it he talks about like sounds like mature Kaku. <laughs> yeah exactly which i mean it's good for me to learn but sometimes I, I i read into it too much and maybe i feel like he's been like a bit disingenuous and this is the, you know. the richard dawkins thing i think right like where it's like don't try and dumb things down too much and you generate yeah. it's like the, the real stuff is cool enough like you don't need to like you know <laughs> add some flourish at the end where you're like and in this way we will touch god you know it's yeah. like just just say what it is and it's cool as it is but yeah not mm. to not to talk shit about Mitch Chicago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like he goes he, on the, he's he covers the whole flatlanders thing which is always good fun you know flat, flat earth yeah like oh, oh not flat earth but like the whole idea of like i guess to to try and encourage us to conceptualize higher dimensions, he talks about oh, like flatland, flat like the math thing, oh, yeah, 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 cool. Um, and and you know this, he has a metaphor about like the koi fish in a pond, like they don't know what is mm-hmm. like. They think of this like membrane of water mm-hmm. as like mm-hmm. there's, there's nothing outside of that, but then someone like whisks out a koi fish mm-hmm. and it drops it back in, and it's suddenly experienced up, and it's like <laughs> tells all its friends, and they're like, "What are you talking about, man? <laughs> is that is that what you talk about sometimes?" Um, the shadow, what's the, oh, the term? Uh, shadow of a Ford. Yeah, so what is it? It's a, um, it's a shape that is, uh, the, it, it represents the shadow of a fourth dimensional. It's called a... Uh, oh, yeah, what is it? Someone sing that time. You, you, talk, you talk, always talk about it. <sighs> it's uh, it's like, like if you take it. Yeah, t- uh, yeah, That's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, cool. So they're fun to look at. And just to, <laughs> yeah. Google Tesseract actually, if you haven't seen one. Yeah, it's, yeah. exactly. Look it's at one fun. for a little while and just think about it and like just really think through your head like this is the shadow mm. of a fourth dimensional object. And it, like 
I actually look at it and I can feel my my mind kind of like unraveling, butting up against like a brick wall. Yeah. Like, I yeah, can it's, see it's it, impossible I can, to visualize. You yeah, can't do it. It's, it's like trying to think of a new color. It's like, yeah. just try, just try. It's, I love that. That fills me with so much, so much wonder. Like mm. trying to, th- <laughs> yeah, you you, you, you you can't be done. Like I'm desert given. It's like your, your human brain cannot conceptualize it. So yeah, you can write it down on paper. Like you can do the maths, but you exactly, can't actually yeah. see it. You know, we were talking about that earlier. Like the the mathematics. That's what it allows us to do is to is to express things in higher dimensions and to explore understandings that we can't really conceptualize in our own mind, which is... Yeah, totally. You know, yeah, yeah, that's, that's where like, the string theory stuff comes. They're like you know, <laughs> 11 spatial dimensions involved in this stuff. Yeah. It's like, whoa. I, I wish I like had that. this kind of like wonder towards math as, like, as I do now in high school because I would have mm. been like sitting in math yeah. class just like, fuck, yeah. yes. Because it's so crazy yeah. that <laughs> humans didn't... I used to think like maths was just some like made up thing thing that we made up but <laughs> yeah. it's like we it actually is the laws of yeah physics and all that we just harness it yeah we just I found I never, it when i was a kid i didn't really realize that it was oh like, yeah it's mm. a yeah it's a it's a pretty startling thing it's like yeah. we yeah we didn't make any of this up we've just discovered it yeah. <laughs> like oh, it's place yeah. here for us to use <laughs> 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 yeah totally <laughs> Yeah, someone like it, it's almost like you think like if you were like if you were going to simulate a universe, you like you have to give it some rules and so yeah. you program in all this stuff. And yeah, then it's like, that's you know, but that's the simulation yeah. hypothesis. You leave little clues in organic <laughs> chemistry. And you're like, yeah. figure this out, and then you live forever. Yeah, see, even that I think sounds too deliberate. It's like for me, it's just like in the simulation hypothesis, it's just like someone's like, oh, I need rules. Boop, 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 boop. Here they are, yeah. and then it's like we're just kind of buddy up against them, and we see them as these like deep cosmic mysteries. But it's like yeah. Yeah. It's some arbitrary decision made in the programming stage yeah uh yeah that, that the simulation hypothesis is also fun to think about i put it on yeah, the I same to ask you what you, yeah. I, I put it in the same kind of camp as like um i don't know i, I put it in the, the slightly more down to earth but same kind of brain box as like you yeah. know uh mystical dark matter stuff where it's like oh yeah i don't know i mean like it's ultimately like it's an unanswerable question it's an indefeatable argument you know you can always say like any evidence contrary to the simulation is just provided by the simulations so like, yeah. you can't it's non-scientific ultimately because you can't you can't argue against it effectively yeah but i do like it's fun to think about you know i mean sure why not it's yeah. it's it's a cool thing to yeah consider. i wonder if it's a good idea or not for elon musk to just say so confidently that yeah i'm 99 percent sure that the that it, we're in a simulation. For me, it's like, why He's does like it matter? that confident about it. For me, yeah, it, it, it just doesn't, doesn't yeah. matter. Like your perception yeah, is the same, whether you're in a simulation or not. Like if it's a simulated reality, what does that mean? Why is that any less meaningful than a real reality? Like what is this real reality you're talking yeah, about? I guess we do have a bias for reality. Yeah, well, exactly, <laughs> because we think we're in one. But like yeah. the reality in which all of this conversation is taking place is the only one we have. Mm. Yeah. So like you either like, yeah, you, you might extract some sadness from your believing that it might be simulated but ultimately what does that mean yeah. like why is it more or less meaningful yeah because if you if we if we ended up making virtual reality as real as reality mm. as we know it sure then what's the difference between if you had no context of a being a virtual reality then yeah you wouldn't yeah you wouldn't yeah, I, I can just see your Rick and Morty microverse poster over ah. the show. <laughs> this discussion about layers of reality. Yeah, yeah, that was a good episode. That's my favorite. So much to that poster. Have you have you actually seen that episode of Rick and Morty? Don't watch it. Oh man, it, it's fucking. Yeah, it hits a nail on the head. It's almost like yeah. uh, like with the culture around at the moment, like it's almost embarrassing to admit that you like Rick and Morty. <laughs> it's like the fans are so bad. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do remember that thing about the, the sauce. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sauce. that was like cringeworthy. Oh, oh. Yeah, it's like I remember watching that show and I, like, I don't know, what are they, like three seasons now? Is it three? Mm-hmm. Yeah, three seasons. And it's like, I don't know, like the first season, it's like, oh, that's cool. Like, yeah, I enjoy the show. And then like the fan base starts growing. And then the, by the end of the third season, like the fan community is so toxic that you just want to distance yourself from it. Yeah. Be like, man, it's a TV show. <laughs> like, just that's probably a, re- a reason why I don't watch it because, mm. well, that's a reason why I don't watch a lot of shows. Mm. Like, because the fan base gets too intense. Like, you should watch this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and I see things online. Like, I haven't watched Breaking Bad because so many people told me about it. I'm like, yeah, get, Breaking Bad's get great. Out of though. <laughs> get out of here. Uh, yeah, I, I will, should probably watch it, though. I will unashamedly <laughs> endorse Breaking Bad. <laughs> it's a very good show. Yeah. yeah. Oh, 
So what are you what are you watching currently in the realm of sci-fi? Oh, in the realm of sci-fi, what am I watching? I'm actually I'm reading um, The Expanse at the moment, which is oh, this like um, yeah yeah. And I started watching the Netflix series, but I'm, I'm kind of like more on the book side of things. Uh, yeah, so The Expanse. If you have never read or heard about it, there is a Netflix series now called The Expanse. It's actually a series of books. I think there are seven, uh, and it's this sci-fi series, sort of in like the the near-ish future of humanity where like humans have kind of expanded to a sort of solar system scale civilization where there's like earth and then there's mars and then there's a whole bunch of people living in asteroids in the asteroid belt Mm -hmm. and on moons like moons of different planets and like it's it's basically about like sort of starts being about like the first sort of war if you want between like earth and mars or it's sort of like in it's sort of always historically been like oh mars is like a colony of earth sort of like the martian population start sort of developing their own kind of identity as you might expect that they would and there's all these tensions between like the different groups involved and like it's really interesting it's really good uh yeah yeah. check it out that spiel reminds me of the fermi paradox in a in a little sense okay and also the carter chef scale yeah they're, they're both like really exciting concepts to me yeah the book actually deals with like <laughs> carter chef scale type ideas a little bit i mean it's kind mm. of spoilery to say how but like it, oh, okay. it does get into that kind of area yeah <laughs> yeah um the the fermi paradox is is one that i enjoy in that um well what do you what do you think about that do you like the, it's this idea that it might explain why we haven't really encountered yeah. like, what is civilization. The paradox is, is that what is it? If there are all these aliens, why haven't we heard from them? Is basically oh, okay, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, it down, yeah. 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 Okay. In yeah. a sense, uh, yeah, I think it's not that surprising if you do the maths that we haven't heard from any aliens, right? Yeah, like uh, the scales are so large, and like we've only been around for like a you know cosmic breath in the wind in terms of like our yeah. ability to actually observe any of this stuff. It's like yeah. Also Some, nuts, but I'm like fully convinced that there are alien civilizations. Yeah. Like it just seems so unlikely that there aren't. But like, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm not surprised, and I wouldn't. You know, it, it's almost like this. Uh, I, have you heard about this idea of like the bottleneck of civilization? Nah. Like we're kind of approaching the bottleneck of civilization, where it's like civilizations like humanity kind of crop up, not that uncommonly, but it's like taking that next step towards being like a solar system scale or beyond. That's like that's the critical bottleneck where like that's you know most civilizations yeah. will die off before reaching that point, and yeah. it's like. Probably we will. I don't know. Because resources are limiting. Yeah, and you limiting. just, you know, you fuck things up like yeah. we constantly seem to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's it. I look at us and, you know, not too long ago, all the tension in North Korea and I was like, mm. oh, we, where it ends? we're going to kill each other before <laughs> yeah. we fucking get off this rock. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe other civilizations decided before they could contact us or find us to, to not to yeah. just like go back into virtual reality <laughs> yeah they saw well. humans and they were like look at these fucking idiots yeah, yeah. let's just <laughs> leave true. them alone yeah, yeah. I, I, there's a fun um kind of like subgenre of sci-fi about like like this sci-fi idea where like humans are like essentially the monsters because like typically uh. when we, we think sci-fi stuff it's like these big creepy aliens but then it's like did you know humans can like lose all their limbs and still survive and like they can live yeah. in like you know 100 degrees of temperature ranges and it's like yeah they can lose all this blood and keep fighting and like all these other alien civilizations are like really peaceful like to get to that level they have to have evolved like we shouldn't just be killing each other all the time yeah. and then they meet yeah. humans and it's like oh my god these warlike Jesus. apes he's just- organic <laughs> yeah. fucking- oh man <laughs> Yeah, these bloodthirsty warlike apes just like steamroll all the other races. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, they always talk about like the Goldilocks zone when they when they're um, when yeah, they yeah. The search for life, but that's always been a funny one for me because it's like it's I don't know. It sort of implies that we're looking out into the universe to try and find life as we know it. Well, yeah, sure. But like, you know, I think that we, we what we're gonna find most likely is that that life is just vastly different to what we expect you know there, there might be life forms that you know breathe in carbon dioxide sure. and exhale oxygen and like operate trees completely differently exactly <laughs> algae. yeah yeah like algae yeah so, well, like algae that's yeah, right yeah, yeah that's <laughs> we know plenty about algae now so. oh that's cool yeah, we, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. like no totally you yeah know, I, I, know, I know what you mean like we're we're it's like um this this idea of like the this is something that someone said to me recently I can't remember who the like uh you're looking you see like a, a guy outside in a dark street like standing under a light post like kind of feeling around on the ground and someone's like oh uh, what are you what are you doing and he's like I've lost my keys and the guy's like oh well like where, do you think you lost them on the light post and he's like no this is just the only place I can see <laughs> so yeah. I'm looking I'm looking here I kind of think about it sort of like that it's like uh. 
you know, like what can we look for other than life as we know it? Like otherwise we're just like completely theorizing what it's like and yeah. like we're like, oh, we're going to go look for all this weird exotic stuff. Like we, yeah. we have to start looking for life that we can understand. And that's why, you know, biological research is very mm. important. We have to figure out how our own life as we understand it works to begin to think about how other kinds of life might work yeah, so we might yeah. know what to be looking for. How different could other could life on other planets be? Like for it to be drastically different, they would have to have different 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 laws of chemistry i guess or uh, probably like same laws of chemistry same laws of physics but yeah, maybe just like single cells they might not have cells it might be some kind of yeah. you know mm. gaseous cloud consciousness well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that takes me back to rick and morty yeah. <laughs> but yeah i'm thinking like to get to cells it probably it took a long time but it's not super complex yeah I think it's pretty complex. It's, <laughs> like, when you yeah, think about like it's random. complex, but it's like if you have the same collection of molecules on this planet and another planet, how, how different could it be? Right. Well, you'd, you'd sort of almost expect like if the starting ingredients are the same, yeah. like you kind That's of expect kind of it to grow yeah. the same way. Yeah, mm. why not? But yeah. uh, you can imagine like other things that might exist, like other kinds of combinations of chemicals. Like people, people talk about like, oh, we're carbon-based life forms. Carbon and silicon are really chemically similar. Maybe there's like silicon-based life forms, mm. and that's you know. Yeah, I guess yeah. things could like one little thing could turn things in a diff- completely different path. Yeah. yeah, and we're ultimately like different kinds deep of in the weeds of theorizing at this point. It's oh, yeah. like you just like <laughs> yeah, it's similar to the dark matter consciousness thinking means like you can you can make stuff up all day and yeah, like yeah, think yeah. about how it might be, you know. Yeah, I like yeah. to um yeah. I like to think about tar- tardigrades. I think they're called tardigrades. Tardigrades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you call me? <laughs> <laughs> like little for people that don't know what they are, like little organisms that are like the size of a like a pinhead, like mm-hmm. a very small. And if someone told you like gave you like a little like a uh, list of stats about these guys and didn't mm. tell you what they were called or where they are. You know, the fact that they've survived on a planet through five mass extinctions, the fact mm. that they can survive in the vacuum of space, you know, the fact that they can ex- uh, survive under extreme cold and heat and they're virtually indestructible. Oh, are these the little uh, worm looking things? Yeah, the they're called things. water bears worm sometimes. Bears. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. if someone told you that, didn't say that they were from Earth, you'd be like, man, that's, that's an alien. That's an alien. That's <laughs> yeah. on another planet, right? Well, octop- that's not here. Octopi. Yeah. I mean, apparently yeah. they can alter their RNA, which is fucking crazy. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. O- o- octopuses, octopi, octopodes, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, they're cool. They're cool things. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think they're like scarily smart. That and crows. Uh, crows yeah. freak crows. me out because <laughs> they're like way too smart. Have you heard this thing? All right, don't quote me on this, but I, I read this somewhere uh, recently that like there were people studying crows on the east coast of Australia because like for a long time crows hadn't been eating cane toads because they're poisonous. Yeah. But then this like one group of crows figured out how to eat cane toads and like avoid the poison glands. Mm. And then these researchers were able to track that information, like travel up the coast, like different groups of crows teaching other crows. Oh and they like observed what looked like a crow lecture where there was like one crow with a cane toad and a bunch of crows <laughs> watching while it like dissects the <laughs> like, so cane toad and like doesn't eat the poison. Like, I was like, I don't know. Yeah, Google that and tell me if it's complete <laughs> no, bullshit. I've, no, I've seen um, crows like sort of standing around like in a circle or whatever, like facing each other, like ah, yeah, just, just I'm like, chewing the fat. They yeah, have to scary. be talking to each other. It's scary how smart they are. And like, uh, you see, you see those videos where like crows like solve puzzles where it's like trying yep. to get the food out of the water. Yeah, they drop the rock in. Yeah, <laughs> it's super cool. Have you seen this? Mm, yeah, yeah, it's, it's very sweet. Google Man. crow videos. I've gone down some YouTube. Oh, totally. Rabbit holes yeah, looking at crows <laughs> doing things. Have you seen videos of um, sh- uh, not sh- uh, what are they called? Cuttlefish. They're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> they're Title of up. this episode: <laughs> Cuttlefish, comma they're fucked. <laughs> Unbelievable. A dark matter story. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the Top Gear guys did like a little ten-minute sort of info documentary thing on them, and it's like they can like without even looking at their environment, they can uh, they can adapt the color of their skin to suit different surroundings yeah i think that's where the rna thing comes in they can alter the rna themselves instead of gene expression just kind of happening or whatever i don't know yeah yeah i don't know much about it i'm not a biologist but that's very cool yeah it's you gotta watch it man they're creepy i've seen them in the i I saw an octopi 
oh, months ago now, but I had an encounter with one. Like an encounter. Yeah, it was. Oh, it was what? just freelancing <laughs> in the you know sort of just above the reef, and then it saw me and just like bolted straight for like the reef, but sat itself in a hole with its eye poking out. And like I got right up close because I was with a friend, and he was like, "Oh, we'll, we'll try and catch it because like we'll eat this shit." So yeah. um, <laughs> your friend is a savage. What the fuck? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just like I was supervising because he went off to get like a stick or something he could use to sort of prod it out, and I was just like, it would like crawl out every now because this was like about three meters down. It would crawl out every now and then, so I sort of had to periodically swim down and try and just scare it back into place mm. to keep it there. Mm. And I, you know, I was like, it was inside this hole, and I was probably this close, just looking into its eye, and it was just like this luminescent kind of almost psychedelic yeah. full of like like colors and i was just looking at it thinking this these things are smart and it's looking at me and yeah, we yeah. got it he ended up coming back with a uh, diving knife that he left on the um beach and when we started poking at it and it actually grabbed a shell and pulled it over the hole like oh, to protect itself funny. i was like oh man like oh, it's, so, it's know, probably looking at me thinking that's fucked yeah yeah totally uh yeah <laughs> brutal what do you think about panspermia? Uh, <laughs> I teased that one out last episode, but I couldn't really. I okay, <laughs> refresh me. Um, is this the idea that like life started somewhere else and came to Earth? Like on yeah. meteorites, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, like maybe, uh, maybe. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not a biologist, but I do. I have like read stuff like this. Like people say, like, oh yeah, life originated outside the solar system, came in on a rock, and like the other. I mean, mm. it seems like I don't know as good or justification as any to a complete non-specialist in that area like you know it has to go from somewhere i ultimately don't actually what i do think about it i guess yeah i ultimately don't see why that's that exciting an explanation it's yeah. kind of like, it doesn't really answer the question it just kind of delays it pushes it somewhere else right? it's like yeah. yeah bang there it is yeah but it also doesn't like answer okay where did the life on that asteroid come from it, it's sort of like yeah. you know it came on an asteroid landed on earth great that's how it got to earth how did it get on the asteroid you haven't mm. actually answered the question of how does life originate but yeah, you know, sure, why not? Maybe. maybe. <laughs> yeah. I've um, I've been getting into Stargate in a massive oh, way. Oh, yeah? Like, Stargate. So good. Yeah, that's cool. Stargate Atlantis. I must say, of oh. the three star franchises, Gate Wars and Trek, it is my least favorite. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. It's, um, no, it blows me away. Like, uh, it just it ticks every single box for me, all the exciting stuff. You know, they're traveling around on wormholes, and, yeah. you know, going into other galaxies and visiting planets. So there's like civilizations at varying levels of technological advancement. And then... Yeah, no, it's cool. Yeah, the okay. concept of like the, uh, the uh, antagonist in that show where it's like this like technologically advanced race that sort of just feeds on every other life form, like, like sheep in like a farm. Mm-hmm. Like they're just... Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it. I only watch nutrition lectures or videos of crows. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I don't know why this has come to mind. He's thinking about like us, like organisms feeding on other organisms. It's like very Matrix, like yeah. the idea that like we're batteries. I I love thinking about like nowadays in this generation, who sort of grew up with the matrix as like this thing it's sort of like oh yeah you can imagine that we're in a simulated reality and i like to think like man if i was like 20 years older imagining seeing that in the cinemas for the first time in like 1999 it's just like that must have been mind-blowing yeah this idea is very i don't know much more evolutionary than obviously it's yeah it's the basis of life though things feeding off other things i guess yeah what was the most ancient cell it was a prokaryotes or eukaryotes i think it's prokaryotes and they consumed other cells, which became a part of them. Mm-hmm. So then they could create organelles and other stuff, which became a eukaryote. And then it got more and more complex, other things feeding off other things. And then us, a bunch of organs, a bunch of cells, bacteria, mitochondria. And Big dumb apes. <laughs> and now we're <laughs> vegans. Vegans, yeah. yeah. What about uh, them? Know. I won't get into that, but <laughs> it just confuses me, the, the logic. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Mm. Are you a vegan? No, I'm not. I'm not okay. vegan. I'm no, not vegetarian. Okay, get into it then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, uh, I, I don't know. I, life I, eats life. It's just yeah, it sure. But like so. even vegans are eating life, right? Eating plants and stuff. I yeah. know. That's yeah. that's it's where I don't get it either. Well, I guess it's like a, okay, okay. I, I will say uh, at the risk of some uh, I don't know Co- controversial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like super jive personally with the like more moral views for like vegan or vegetarianism. I'm certain that other people will say oh it's because you haven't read enough or blah 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 blah, whatever fine um 
I can kind of understand the environmental perspective on it to a degree where yeah. I'm like, oh, the food industry is really fucked. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe. I mean, I don't do it myself, but yeah. I can at least understand it. I, I also I also ultimately don't see the point in, um, I don't know, why people eat what they want. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to be a vegan, go ahead. Yeah, these, are, these are my views and not yours, but yeah, yeah. the agricultural <laughs> side of it, the produce is also fucked as well as, mm -hmm. yeah, the sustainability of meat. Mm -hmm. It's all fucked if it's mass produced. Mm -hmm. yeah, is it not to... considerably less though like in terms of water required and farmland required and co2 produced to generate like crops yeah. than it is to generate animals uh or? well animals uh ruminants like cows graze mm -hmm. like they eat the grass but they don't like destroy the grass mm -hmm. so they graze the grass it grows back because they just eat the, the infant part of the mm -hmm. grass mm -hmm. instead of the root so it's kind of traditionally it's pretty sustainable mm -hmm. but i guess if you have a country the size of America with the insatiable appetite they have, then it can't really work like that. And you get then you got to have massive feedlots. Yeah, I mean, you know, I definitely to, to sustain the protein need, which they don't need. Mm. So, well, yeah, that's the thing. I definitely eat like less meat these days yeah. than I used to. Yeah. <laughs> like, yep. Cut it right down. Yeah. Yeah. Ted Nugent made a good point. Okay. Um, <laughs> and Not uh, a thing often said. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it was interesting to think about. He was What he was saying is, and I don't know how true this is, but I'm just going to say it anyway, and that's I'm prefacing it. Mm -hmm. um, but he said that people that are vegetarian or vegan, like when you're producing crops that for, you know, to sustain those diets, um, there's actually a lot of animals that are killed in the process, like birds and and various like small like um, critters and land based like sort of animals that like they they have to to kill an enormous amount of them to to be able to farm it without them disrupting the that process. So he was saying that more animals are killed to produce that kind of food than you would think. So it's not entirely like devoid of you know cruelty. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like yeah. you can't. A vegetarian can't just like wash their hands clean and say we're all good. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of massive I mass crop production, they use a lot of pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, which destroys the topsoil, etc. This is something I spend a lot more time thinking about, mm -hmm. and this is my mm -hmm. area. yeah, sure. This is your jam. Yeah. And, um, this is my jam. Yeah, right. Yeah. But, uh, what so. What do you guys think about um, genetically modified organisms? Uh, I it's a it's an inter it's interesting one because. I'm not against the idea of GMOs, of genetically modifying stuff, but it's it's what it does to certain parts of the environment mm -hmm. because you have GMO crops because they've gotten to a point where the amount of pesticides they put on it is too much for like a non-GMO crop. Mm -hmm. So they have to create this like but crop that's like impervious to all the, pest the, the toxicity of yeah. glyphosate mm -hmm. or whatever. But in the process, it kills the soil. So they 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 make these and the runoff, etc. So it's not really the fact that it's a GMO crop; it's like everything else around it. So they make these like like more disease resistant GMOs, right? Yeah. Like the the ones that don't require pesticide. And the implication is that they're bad for the like local environment. Is that what you're saying? No, the ones that because there's certain crops that because glyphosate, for example, like it will kill plants mm -hmm. just at the most basic level like the plant plastids so mm -hmm. it's their mitochondria and i guess to to keep using more and more pesticides yeah have these gmos that are resistant to that pesticide that's another thing having gmos that are resistant to disease mm -hmm. that's a good thing i like that mm -hmm. okay so you're pro some other, gmos and anti other gmos yeah, exactly that which the, is okay. why it's like a it's not a binary yeah, sure. sort of yeah. thing yeah Fair enough. I, I tend yeah. to like actively avoid things that market themselves as GMO free because I'm like, if you're doing that, like you're trading on ignorance essentially. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's like, you know, the GMOs can also kind of save a lot of lives. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. it's a probably a good thing, you know, yeah, uh, on the whole. Yeah. yeah. I try and avoid things. I mean, I try and I actually go for things that specifically say like pesticide free. Because mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. just just to be safe, I don't mm -hmm. want that in my food, mm -hmm. as well as hormone free f meat and stuff. Mm. Yeah, because there's still a lot of things that have uh, yet to be washed out. Long term effects, yeah, that we not well understood. Really yeah, I can understand that. Understood. Yeah, mm. I mean DDT. Actually, no, I won't get into all that. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. 
Yeah. We've got to go in reasonably short order. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. that's all right. We'll wrap cool. it up then. Yeah. Um, Social media shout outs. Yeah, do you – so you mentioned before we started chatting that you've got a podcast. Can, you know, do you yeah. want to cite the oh, website? Oh, it's or? a little plug a rug for you. Um, yes, I, I actually have a little network. It's called Curio Network, C-U-R-I-O. You can check us out at curionetwork.com. We don't do anything uh, – yeah? Yeah. Should I be – no, it's going to pop on the screen. Oh, probably. cool. Yeah. Somewhere down here. I yeah. thought it wasn't my camera. So I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, no. Curionetwork.com. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we make a couple of podcasts. Uh, basically, we've made three. One of them is kind of like finished season one, might come back for season two, and the other two are kind of, kind of still going. There's a sort of narrative fiction Dungeons and Dragons podcast. Yeah. But it's kind of like comedy fun. It's called How to Win Loot and Influence Dragons, which is my yeah, favorite yeah. part about it is the name. Uh, so definitely, definitely check that out. It's got me. I'm the Dungeon Master and a couple of my cool friends. And then the other one is awesome. this like movie discussion podcast called Still Interested, which is about TV and film that have been rebooted or remade. Uh, we look at like the franchises and try and figure out why they wanted to reboot something and then whether they actually succeeded in doing a good job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's that. And on the research side, yep, um, yep, uh, things that matter. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yes. So I'm Ben McAllister. You can check out all my papers if you just Google my name, Ben McAllister, physics or UWA or organ should come up. I've got a page on the archive, which is this big physics paper archive. All my publications are on there for free. Um, or ResearchGate, which is sort of like a LinkedIn for scientists. You can check me out there if you want. Uh, I want to give a quick plug. If you're a voter or taxpayer, support the. Uh, idea of dark matter research in australia we've got these like a couple of experiments that are sort of coming together we've got organ which is this axion dark matter detection thing working on the other side we've got saber which is this big wimp detection thing in rural victoria so if you think any of that dark matter stuff we were talking about is cool and you want australia to be on the forefront of it those are the things you need to keep in mind Go awesome. on to it, people. Yeah, cool. That'll all, all right. be in the show notes too. So. Great. Yeah. Oh, thanks, yeah. guys. Thanks so much for coming in, man. This yeah, thanks for having great. me. It's been good. It's been a good chat. Yeah, it's been fun. All right. Oh. Cool.